Praise the Lord. Father God, we thank you this morning for this opportunity that you have given us to worship you and to love you and to lift up our voices and our hearts to you this morning. We're so grateful. So grateful, Lord, for being able to come into your presence with brothers and sisters in the Lord and to commemorate a great day. Our brother in our church being clean and sober for one year. And we dedicate this sermon to him this morning, Lord, and to others who are trying to overcome addictions. So, Father, we ask for your blessing, for your mercy, for your grace to flow through us. That, Lord God, others might be touched as they see this sermon or hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Most of you are too young to remember, of course. I'm 76 years old. In 1958 through 1963, there was a program on television in New York. It was called Naked City. And it was a story about one person. It was based on the 65th precinct of the police department in the city. When we lived in the city of Brooklyn, in the city, there was different precincts. And people would identify what precinct you lived in, 62nd precinct, 65th precinct. But this movie was based, this uh, program that was on each week was based from a movie called The Naked City. And at the end of this movie, it always told the story of one person. A story. I want you to remember that word, story. And at the end of the program, after the program was ended, the narrator would say these words. There are eight million stories in the naked city. This has been one of them. At that time, there was eight million people living in the city. I always concluded the program with these words. There are eight million stories in the naked city. This has been one of them. I want to speak to you this morning on this subject. What story is being written about your life? You see, my friend, everyone here has a story. You all have a background, you all have an upbringing, you all have a story that has good parts, bad parts, sorrowful, happy, the whole thing. But the question is, is what story is being written about your life? The story began in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's when the story began for man. Everything began in, began in perfection. He created man. He created a perfect garden of Eden to be the dwelling of Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 it says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and became a living soul. And the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. In Genesis 3.21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man, he made a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Everything remained perfect. Everything was great in the Garden of Eden. There was no flies, no mosquitoes, no germs, no weeds, no sickness, no death. It was perfect until an infiltrator came in. And that infiltrator was Lucifer. And he infiltrated the Garden of Eden and caused our first parents to disobey the commands of God and they sinned. And what was perfection turned into imperfection. So who was the infiltrator? Who was this infiltrator that came into the garden? The story for Lucifer began in Ezekiel chapter 28 and 13. Now Lucifer was a created being. God created him in heaven. And he was the choir director of heaven. He worshipped God. He, he led the songs and the singing. But the Bible says in Ezekiel 28 and 13, he says, Thou hast been in Eden, in the garden of Eden. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. And the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set 
thee so. Thou wast only upon the mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. What does this mean? God created Lucifer, who was the choir director of heaven, but he decided that he wanted God's job. He decided he wanted to be the boss. He decided that he was going to persuade other angels in heaven to deflect and defect from God and from heaven. You see, for Lucifer, he began in perfection, but he will end in a lake of fire. Lucifer became the villain, the seducer, the manipulator, the liar, the opposition. He caused havoc and rebellion in heaven, and God had to deal with him severely. He went out from choir director. He went from choir director in heaven to a crashing exit to the earth to become the number one nemesis of God and all those that would follow Christ. Now, some people say, well, I don't believe a devil exists. I don't know if you've ever been to New York City. But go to Times Square and take a chair and sit on a street corner and watch the world go by and tell me if the devil doesn't exist. Tell me the devil doesn't exist when over 300 people a day are dying of drug overdose. I said not a week, but a day. Come on. That's 300 a day. Now, if a plane fell from the sky that had 300 passengers, you would be alarmed, wouldn't you? But how much more alarmed would you be if that plane fell every day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year? That's what's happening, my friend. Who are these people? Who are the addicted? Your moms, grandmas, grandpas, sons, daughters, nieces, nephews, cousins. And they're dying every day. And it seems like we've gotten used to that statistic. And every year it goes up. Last year it was 250. Now it's actually 301 that I read the other day. God had to get rid of Lucifer out of heaven. The Bible says in Luke 10, 18, And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. God decided, you have to go. You see, God can't have division. God hates division. And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to divide families. He wants to divide loved ones. He wants to divide churches. He wants to divide our country, as you can see right now what's happening in America. Because he's a seducer, a manipulator, a liar. He's an infiltrator. And he wants people to become addicted. He wants people to die of drugs and alcohol and overdoses. He wants that. Because he hates God. And he hates God's creation. The Bible says that he was a flash in the pan. He was like sent forth to the earth like lightning. Praise God. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. We have power with God. We have power over addiction. We're not powerless. We have power with God. Hallelujah. And we have power with our brothers and sisters in the Lord who join faith together to help us overcome, to help each other praise God. Say, hey, listen, you can make it. You can do this. And we can praise God. And we can pray for you and help you. That's what church is about, my friend. It's not about some habitual religious act that we come here and sing a few songs and go home. No, it's helping one another. It's loving one another. It's caring about one another. Amen. It's looking at this house of God as a family, as brothers and sisters Amen. in the Lord. That's why we call each other brother and sister. Because of the <coughs> shed blood of Christ that came. You see, the enemy knows in Revelation 12, 7, there's a great war going on. Even now, my friend. The Bible says in Revelation 12 and 7, And there was a war in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was there a place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil, devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he had a short time. 
The enemy knows he has a short time and he's working overtime in our homes, working overtime in our families, and working overtime in our children's lives. Because he knows the day is coming where he's going to be chained and put in the lake of fire forever. So he wants to produce havoc right now. He wants to instill division and hatred and bitterness in people's lives. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1, he says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed for his season. He's going to continue havoc until Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7 takes effect. This is future. And when the thousand years are expired, when he's loosed, Satan shall be loosed out of the prison, and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, and the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. There's going to come a day when the infiltrator will have no more power and influence over mankind. There'll come a day when he's locked up forever. Never, never, never able to torment a person again. Lucifer messed up the Garden of Eden that was created perfect. He messed up our first parents. He blighted their story. Now listen carefully. Our family picture album has been marred. When Adam and Eve sinned, that family picture was marred. It was no longer perfect. It became imperfect. Adam and Eve, as our parents, got messed up. And their marriage with God became a spiritual divorce. And they did not live the words, and they lived happily ever after. It didn't happen. They became sinful, imperfect people. And every child that's born of a mother's womb is sinful and imperfect. And man does not like to recognize that. Because we like to think of ourselves as good people. But the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone. The shame is not doing something with the sin. And asking Christ to forgive us and to help us live a healthy spiritual life. Always remember that there are consequences for bad decisions. The decisions that you make today will affect your every tomorrow. And people make bad decisions. And then they want to blame God for the bad decisions that they made. And when they make those bad decisions, they come to the present moment and they look at their life and they say, man, I am messed up. The family picture has been marred. I've alienated myself from my family, from my God, from my friends in the lifestyle that I've lived. And the enemy has succeeded in conquering another soul to not live for God. Some people blame God that they're not happy. But they don't want to recognize their poor choices. Choices made without God's word. Choices made without God's guidance. Choices made without God's counseling puts people in a miserable position. But the good news is this. Your story is not over. Neither is mine. Because God is writing that story every day in your life or desires to do that. You see, the enemy wants to write a chapter in your book today. The enemy wants you to leave this house of God and say, yeah, that was nice. Music was nice. And maybe you even say the preacher was okay. And you leave. And you go in the parking lot. And you go home. 
But I guarantee you, you will not forget the service that you were in this morning. Because what's here this morning is God's love pulling people constantly, brothers and sisters, to him closer and closer and closer. And if you don't know Christ, he wants to bring you to his bosom. He wants to bring you to his heart that you can feel his heartbeat this morning in the forgiveness of sins. You see, my friend, God wants to write some new chapters in your book. You see, we all have a plan. Everyone has a plan. Everybody has an agenda. I had a plan. I was going to be a professional baseball player. Then I became a psychologist. I thought that was the plan. I thought that was going to make me happy. I thought, man, I'd become rich. I'll be a millionaire. And I'll have everything that I need. Until God stopped me one day and said, hey, I want to be your friend. And he made me a preacher. Imagine that. Made me a preacher. Praise the Lord. And so now, praise God, through Christ, I can give hope to other human beings. I can tell them, hey, you might have a good plan, but is it God's plan? You might have a good agenda, but is it God's agenda? And somehow God wants to put our train back on the right track, praise God, so that we end up in the right depot. Hallelujah. Can you say amen, my friends? You see, you don't have to stay in the position you're in. An alcoholic doesn't have to remain an alcoholic. A drug addict doesn't have to remain in drugs. A sinner doesn't have to remain in sin. Because God says, it's not too late for me to write a new chapter in your story and create a new book. I worked in the prison system for 20 years and I had a men's church and a women's church. And I counseled thousands of women who were addicted, who were prostitutes, who had to earn money to put food on their table. They were pimped out. They took the crime for their boyfriends and went to prison for them. Well, one of the things I used to do with those women was this. I said, I want you to go to the bookcase and get me a book. And they kind of look at me. I said, go get me a book, sister. And they bring the book back. And they say, you see this book? It's got a lot of words in it. I said, I want you to put the book back in the bookcase. What do you want me to do, Pastor? I said, we're going to make a new book. See, that new book has blank pages. And many of those girls came to church and they accepted Christ because they wanted a new life. And I had to constantly remind them that today is the first day of the rest of your life. What you did back then doesn't count anymore. You came to Jesus. He doesn't even remember it. And I said, we're going to write a new book. And I used to challenge them. And I said, I want you to do some artistic work on the cover of your new book. What's the title of your book? What's some of the chapters in your book? I want you to draw some nice pictures on the front that tell about you. And those blank pages, I want you to believe that God wants to fill those blank pages with a new story. And it's your story. It's not her story. It's not her story. It's not my story. But this is your story. And your story is precious and special before God because he wants to help you write that story for him to give him glory and honor. I want you to look at a man in the Bible who lost focus. His name was Samson. In Judges chapter 16 and verse 15, Samson had an addiction. It was a sexual addiction. He just lusted after women all the time, sort of like Solomon. Kind of like King David. Same addiction. And so God was using Samson mightily, but he had a weakness. He allowed the enemy to infiltrate his life. He allowed the enemy to influence him. And in Judges chapter 16 and verse 15, and she said unto him, this is Delilah who is going to deceive him now. A woman is going to deceive Samson. How can thou say, I love thee, when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. You see, Samson was a Nazarite. And the Nazarites were not allowed to drink. And they were supposed to grow their hair and not cut it. 
to identify them as different before God. And they were called Nazarites. But Samson met up with this woman who wanted to know the secret of his strength because Samson had supernatural strength as he worked for God. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. She just bothered him every day. Tell me, I want to know what your strength is. Then he told her all his heart. And there was a big mistake right there. Because Delilah was an infiltrator used by Lucifer and Satan and the devil to cause Samson to fall. You have to be careful of infiltration in your life. And he told her all his heart and said to her, There has not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. He opened his heart to this lady. She deceived him. He said, you want to know how my strength is, how I get my strength? By not cutting my hair. I'm a Nazarite. I've been set apart by God. And the Bible says in verse 18, here's the betrayal. <coughs> hey, listen, everyone in this room, you've been betrayed at least one time in your life. You've been let down, betrayed. There's been a Judas in your life. You know what I'm talking about. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. And then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. You see, she sold out Samson for money. For money. A little bit of change. A little bit of jingo. A little bit of money. Because those Philistines were going to come in and cut his hair. And Samson will lose all of his strength. And she made him sleep upon her knees and she killed for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven lots of his head. And she began to afflict him and, sh and his strength went from him. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and he said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. And he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. You see, Samson thought as he woke up and his hair was cut, he thought, I'll shake myself one more time and I'll have the power. But the power left. The lights went out. The electric, so to speak, was not working anymore. The motor went dead. And Samson shook himself. But that's not the end of the story. You see, Samson's addiction caused him great harm and great pain. And a story was now being written about Samson. But that story was not ending yet. You see, what happened to Samson? The Philistines, in verse 21, took him and they put out his eyes. Can you imagine? Because of this woman and because of his cooperation with her, by opening his heart to her, his eyes were gouged out. Can you imagine? You just get a little, little thing in your eye. And it's like, wow, that really hurts. Can you imagine somebody holding you down and poking your eyes out? You see, addiction has consequences. Sin has consequences. They put his eyes out and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. Now he was pushing a wheel to grind the wheat into grain. Blind. No more power. The Bible says, how be it the hair on his head began to grow again after he was shaven. You see, the Philistines were so stupid and dumb they didn't realize that if his hair grew back, he might get that power back. That's how dumb they were. You see, the devil is not that smart. Come on. He's seductive. It's when we're not smart that he seduces us. Come on. He's not that bright. He tips himself off. He almost tells you what he's going to do. But if mankind that succumbs to stupidity it allows them to come in to their life and infiltrate and deceive. So here's Samson down at the wheel. 
and his hair is growing back. And then the lords of the Philistines gathered together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God, and to rejoice, for they said, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. They were rejoicing. Look what we did. We overcame Samson through Delilah. Hold on to your horses because the story is not over. And not over for you either. It's still being created. It's still being written. And when the people saw him, they praised their God for they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry, they said, Call for Samson that they make sport of him. And they called for Samson out of the prison house. And he made sport. They made sport and they set him between the pillars. Now they're going to make fun of him. They're going to make fun of a man that's blind. His eyes are gouged out. He's lost his power. He was once a great man of God. And now people are laughing at him. Disrespecting him. And disrespecting the God that created him. You see, the people thought they won a victory that day. They thought, look, 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 look what we've accomplished. The Bible says, Samson said, let me die with the Philistines, God. And he bowed himself with all his might. Listen, excuse me. Now the house where they brought him, these pillars, was full of men and women in verse 27. And all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. 3,000 people screaming and cheering and saying, well, where's your God now? Where is your God? Where's your power? And Samson came to himself. Just like an addict comes to that moment in his life or she you come to yourself and you say, this isn't working. Come on. My best thinking got me here. And it's not been good. The road has been bumpy. The tragedy has been monumental. The consequences have been just off the charts. And for many, their health. If you're an alcoholic, your liver, if you're a drug addict. Begins to deteriorate and become hard like shoe leather. You can't process the poisons. That's what the liver does in your body. It wants to process the poisons out of your body. And they begin to build up and attack your organs on the inside. People don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. Until you come to what they call your bottom. Until you start to look up and you say, what am I doing? Where am I going? This is not living. This is crazy. And it's at that moment you come to yourself and you say, I need some help. And I'm going to go get some help. Because I need that help. Samson, the Bible says in verse 28, he called upon the Lord. You see, it's never too late to call upon God. And he said, oh Lord God, remember me. I pray thee and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. You know what he's saying? Give me one more chance. Give me one more opportunity to be victorious for you. Don't deny me. Don't leave me. But come to me. And Samson took hold of the two pillows upon the house that stood on which it was borne up and of the one with his right hand and the other with his left hand. 3,000 people. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He knew he was going to die. He said, that's okay. Because I'm getting my life right back with God. And God is going to take me back. Even though I have sinned and I've let him down and I told the secret of my strength. God, give me one more opportunity, one more chance. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords, upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which slew in his life. 
Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him in Zorah and Eshetal in the burying place of Manoah his father and he judged Israel 20 years. You see, God finished his story with victory. Not with defeat. He wrote that last chapter for Samson. Samson prayed. He said, God, just give me one more shot. It's kind of like a baseball player with two outs and two strikes and the base is loaded. And if you hit a home run, your team wins. <laughs> Listen carefully. I want to speak to you for a few more minutes here. You see, verse 28 was saying when he asked God, and he told God he was sorry, he was saying, Lord, make my life count. Make my life count just one more time, God. Just one more chance. You see, man wrote his own story by rejecting God and the preaching of Noah, and they made a decision that they didn't want God in those days. Noah built a boat. He built an ark, and only eight people got on the boat when there was millions of people. They decided their story. But God said, I'm going to create a new story. I'm going to make a new story. And in the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, Nothing has changed, my friend. The wickedness of man is great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord. God was sorry that he made man, that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. You see... The same enemy that was present in the days of Noah, the same enemy that was present in the Garden of Eden, is the same enemy that has been working and is presently working in the world and in people's lives with one purpose. To blot out lives and blemish their story from ending with the words, and they lived happily ever after. It's possible to live happily ever after but only with him. Oh, you'll strive for it. You'll fight for it. You'll work for it. You'll even go up the corporate ladder for it. You'll get all kinds of degrees. I did. I have five. What does that make me? It doesn't make me get into heaven. What's important is Christ. What's important is Jesus. What's important is saying to the Lord, I want you to write my story so that I can be proud of what you're doing in my life and I can share my story with other people. Hmm. We learn great lessons from Egypt. God sent Moses to be the earthly rescuer, empowered by God's Spirit. The Jewish people were in bondage for over 400 years. And through Moses, God sent plagues and judgment. And in doing so, Moses became the heavenly rescuer. But we must recognize and beware that there's an ongoing problem even today in society. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 10 says, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. You see, it's the same today. People are too busy for God. We're so busy doing our thing and trying to cause our agenda and our story to be fulfilled because everyone's looking for happiness. But the bottom line is everyone's looking for love. You know, working with the addicted population for as long as I did, they said I, numbers I counseled, 20,000 people one-on-one -on -one in the prison system. 20,000, that's a lot of people. And I learned a lot from them. And some people used to ask me, why do you think a person becomes an addict? I said, well, I said, if you want a very simple answer that maybe you will not accept, I'm going to tell you why. And it's so simple that it escapes people's minds. They said, what's the answer, Pastor? They're looking for love. An addict wants to be loved. 
but not just an addict. Every human being that's been born into the world is looking for love, looking for a partner, looking for someone that would understand them, someone that you can share your heart with, someone you can share your life with. It's love. But it's God's love that we're looking for. And when you find God's love, you'll understand human love. Because human love can only take you so far. Human love is friendship. Human love is conjugal. It's eros. It's sexual. But God's love is agape. And a wholesome marriage is a marriage that has filio, eros, and agape. And when one of those is missing, you got trouble. You got trouble. Because right there, the enemy is trying to rewrite a story about your home and your marriage. Or your individual life. Are you looking for hate today? No. Are you looking for confusion today? No. Are you looking for failure today? No. You're looking for love. That's what we're all looking for. And when the Bible says God is love, why don't we come to him? Because his love is perfect. His love will take us. Even where we've ever been in the miry clay of life, no matter what we've done, he calls us and he says, I love you. I created you. But there's a fight going on and a story trying to be written about your life. And when you were born, Satan was on one side of your mother and Jesus Christ was on the other. And Satan said, he's mine. Satan said, she's mine. And the Lord said, no, he's mine. And the Lord said, no, she's mine. And there's been a fight and a clash ever since you were born for your soul. Listen carefully. God is saying, I'm reading a quote from John Eldridge from the book Epic. He said, God becomes the wounded lover when we continue to write our own story without him. God becomes the wounded lover when we continue to write our own story without him. God is the wounded lover. The dilemma of the story is this. We don't know if we want to be rescued. Some people don't even know if they want to be rescued. Some people debate, do I want to be rescued? Do I want to come out of this? Do I want to change? Do I really want a new story? My life's not that bad. You have to determine that. He goes on to say, we are enamored with our small stories and our false gods. We are so bound up in our addictions and our self-centeredness and take it for granted that we don't even know how to cry out for help. And the evil one has no intention of letting his captives walk away scot-free. He seduces us, deceives us, whatever it takes to keep us in darkness. Do you remember when you were a kid, you wanted to be the hero? You wanted to be the person that hit the home run? You wanted to be the person that threw the touchdown, won the race? You wanted to be the hero in someone's life and rescue them from danger? When I was a kid, we used to take our jackets and reverse them and put them around our neck and have it like a cape around our back and we'd run through the streets of Brooklyn as you little kids and thinking we were Superman. We'd jump off of porches like Superman. Of course, we always watch Superman almost every night in the city. He was our hero. We wanted to be like Superman. Today there's different heroes, wrestling heroes, boxing heroes, Sports heroes. We want to be somebody. We all want to be a hero. So God said, let me be your hero. You see, what he did was he stepped through the veil. You see, he came from heaven, born of a virgin as a baby, and grew up to be crucified on the cross, to die on the third day and rise again. See, he became our hero because he's the only one that can rewrite your story. He's the only one that can give you a new book with no lines and no words and give you a title for that new book and set you apart once again 
You see, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. You see, what the enemy was allowed to do in the Garden of Eden, what the enemy was allowed to do in the days of Noah, God says, I want to step in. And he sort of pushed the veil apart that separates heaven from earth. And he stepped in. He stepped in. And he said, I want to be your hero. My father sent me to love you and to care for you. Please don't reject me. Please don't say no. You don't have to live that kind of life you're living in despair. In pain. So many people are in pain this morning. Emotional pain. Emotional prison. And they remain there. Until someone comes along, maybe like myself, and says God has keys that he wants to put into the lock of your heart. And open your heart to let the hero, the true hero, come in. Who is... Jesus Christ. Jeremiah the prophet said in Jeremiah 24 and 7, I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. God is crying this morning for people to come back to him. He said in John 15 and 9, As my Father loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. You see, God the hero stepped through the veil to write a new story in our life and to sing a new song to us. Everybody likes music. Music can be soothing, therapeutic, cathartic. Music has a way of bringing us into a new realm. But there's a song that Christ wants to sing to our hearts. You see, Jesus was the ransom, the ultimate sacrifice. He laid down his life that we could take ours up. He paid the highest price. He died on the cross. Matthew 20 and 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He gave his life for us. It looked as though the efforts where Jesus were thwarted when he died on the cross. The demons were hailing. Lucifer was hailing and saying, look at the victory. We got him nailed to the cross. The enemy struck and death took place. But would death itself be overcome by our hero? Could death be overcome? Could Jesus wake up? My friend Jesus ignored death and shook it off. He put it to the side and he laid it down for three days to make sure everyone knew he was dead. And then something happened in that tomb. <laughs> I said something precious happened in that tomb, my friend. <laughs> you see, it was love that nailed him to the cross, not the Roman soldiers. He was nailed to the cross for me and for you. To become our hero. You see, we're all looking for a hero. But there are false heroes out there. That want to step into your life and mess you up. Inspired by Lucifer, Satan, and the devil. But he wanted people to know he was really dead. So why three days? He told us the story in the Old and New Testament. He said in Matthew 12 and 40, people don't know this, but the word says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You know that old whale story you read as a kid? It was true. I know people today say, wow, that wasn't true. Really? You could believe it wasn't true, and that's on you. But Jesus told us in the days of Jonah, he says, as he was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so will I be three days and three nights in the tomb. What? He really messed up the minds of the religious people of that day when he came and he said in John 2.19, Jesus answered and said, destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. And they said, the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building. And you're going to rear it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. That's how stupid they were. Sure, it took 46 years to build that physical temple. But Jesus said, in three days, this temple 
will rise again. They didn't get it. And people today don't get it. They hear, they see, but they don't really hear, and they don't really see. Some still don't get it today. You see, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3.15, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. There's people that have a veil upon their eyes that they refuse to hear the truth and refuse to accept the truth. Let me try to close here this morning. Jesus wants to be your hero. That sounds so simple, doesn't it? He wants to make you a hero. A Joshua, a Moses, an Esther, a Paul, or a John. You see, there's a longing in our heart to be a hero from our youth. A superman or a superhero of some sort. And many times we live vicariously through other people. We want to be the hero that defeats the villain. Listen, I'm a great sports lover. I've seen some amazing athletes. The other day I watched a replay of a film of a World Series, the first game of a World Series. And I was by no means a Dodger fan, but I like to view this film. <coughs> the Dodgers were losing by two runs in the bottom of the ninth inning, first game of the World Series. And Kirk Gibson, one of the best hitters in baseball, had a hamstring injury and he could hardly walk with two outs. The Dodger manager sent Kirk Gibson up to pinch hit, a left-handed hitter, and one of the greatest relief pitches to pitch in baseball was pitching against him. I've seen this film numerous times. Kirk Gibson took a couple of balls, took a couple of strikes, fouled a few pitches, and with anticipation, down to one strike. The Dodgers were down by one strike. The pitcher comes. He throws the ball. And Kirk Gibson takes that swing as a left-handed batter and meets that ball with the bat. And that ball begins to sail over the right field fence for a home run. And hobbling all around the bases, they didn't even know if he was going to be able to make it around the bases. Kirk Gibson became the hero of the first game of the World Series. Everybody wants to be a hero one time or another in their life. Everybody wants to be a rescuer one time or another in their life. Jesus is that hero. He always hits a home run. He always wins the game. He never loses. He's never lost a boxing match. He's conquered. And he says to us that we can be more than conquerors through him that loves us. You see, God has a plan. And that plan is to redeem man and woman and make a, him a hero in the spirit world. Would you be that man or a woman or a boy or a girl today because God is calling for you to become that hero? You see, we have to help people become the person that God wants them to become through love and compassion that Jesus Christ gives us. Some time ago I wrote a few quotes down. And I want to end with these quotes. And a small commentary the Lord gave me. And if you've heard nothing that I've said this morning, I want you to hear what I'm going to tell you. The author is unknown on this first quote. And it says this, to love someone is to learn the song that's in that person's heart and to sing it to them when they have forgotten. I'm going to repeat it. To love someone is to learn the song that's in that person's heart and to sing it to them when they have forgotten. The second quote comes from Winston Churchill, a great leader who once said, if you have an important point to make, don't try to be subtle or clever. Use a pile driver. 
hit the point once, then come back and hit it again, and then hit it a third time, a tremendous whack. And Billy Graham was asked what he thought was the greatest theological quote that he could come up with. And Billy Graham said this, the greatest theological quote that he believed in was this, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I wrote this in the Lord. Some call, sometimes in the course of daily life, in the hustle and bustle, in the duties and responsibilities, the pain and suffering, we forget the song that God put in our heart. The three quotes above remind me that God is the person who sings that song in our heart, especially when life sidetracks us from his love and presence. Our busyness, our preoccupations, our restlessness, our struggle with life sometimes superimposes itself so we don't hear God's love song to us. In those moments, God makes an important point in our life by using the pile driver of his voice to speak to us not once, not twice, but three times that he loves us. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, God desires to write a new story in your life. It doesn't matter what we've done in the past, that's over. Today is the first day of the rest of our lives. How are we going to live it? The future is full of promise. I don't care what the devil says, I don't care what politicians say, because I know what the Bible says. I know what the Bible says. And I began this sermon by referring to that movie that was on when I was a kid, Naked City. 1958 to 1963 it ran. And there was 8 million people in that city. It was the story of the 65th precinct in New York, police precinct. And it always keyed in on one story, one person. And it always ended this way. The narrator would say, there are 8 million stories in the naked city. This has been one of them. You see, my friend, there's a lot of stories here this morning. And only when we allow God to write that story in our life do we become the hero that he wants us to become. It's a great testimony when you can have a cup of coffee with someone and tell them how God and others helped you overcome addiction. Overcome the pain and the consequences and the heartache and the failure. And look into the eyes of a human being that is searching who wants help, but doesn't know how to get it, but that camaraderie, and you begin to sing the song that they forgot in their heart, and you begin to remind them that God wants to place that song back into their hearts. Let us pray. Father, thank you. I appreciate you this morning, Lord, for what you've done in my life and in the life of this church. I appreciate your grace and your mercies. I appreciate the testimonies Brother Joe, this morning, one year, sober, and there's a number of us in this church, oh God, that were addicted to the things of the world. But then there's something my wife reminded me of last week. She said, honey, I knew I was born in sin because that's what the Bible says. But I never had an addiction. I was saved when I was a little girl, eight years old. And I said, what are you trying to say? She says, we hardly ever talk about God's keeping power. God's keeping power. We have to understand that God has power to keep us after we have overcome the alcohol, the drugs, and the things of life. My wife has a great testimony. A great testimony that God has kept her since she's eight years old. Praise the Lord. And you want to hear a little side note? My wife told me, she says, I was praying for my husband when I was a little girl. Little did I know she was praying for me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise God. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your love, grace, and mercies. In Jesus' name, amen.